It's kind of a better picture of it. Um, there's the pelvic diaphragm there. The levator ani would be these two, the iliococcygeus, pubococcygeus. You see that the coccygeus has nothing to do with the ani. There's the obturator internus. There's the tendon where it gives rise. There's another muscle back here that gives, comes off the sacrum. That's called the piriformis, P-I-R-I, piriformis. You're going to see this in lab today, piriformis. The piriformis arises from inside the pelvis and goes through the greater sciatic foramen to insert out here on the femur. We're going to really pay attention to it when we get to the gluteal region, I think, Wednesday. As far as males and females, uh, from the bottom, this is what you look for. Um, there's a defect in the uh, pelvic diaphragm anterior for passage of the urethra in males and females and in the vagina in the females. Here's the pelvic diaphragm right here. That would be coccygeus. There's the ilio, or pubococcygeus right there. There's the puborectalis. And then right around here is what's called the external anal sphincter. You have an internal anal sphincter that's autonomic. And it's like the internal urethral sphincter when there's stool in the rectal ball. It relaxes. <coughs> the only thing keeping you from pooping on yourself is the external anal sphincter. Now, there's one more structure down here I'm going to mention today, but this is going to be the, the heart of the talk tomorrow. This is the pelvic diaphragm you see here. So there's another triangular-looking structure right there. That's called the urogenital diaphragm. Urogenital diaphragm. And if you look at it from the bottom, it's more superficial than the pelvic diaphragm. But we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Now, here's that uh, sacrospinous ligament there forming the greater sciatic foramen. Most everything leaving the pelvis, except for the obturators and the pudendals. Well, no, the pudendals too, just the obturator goes through the greater sciatic foramen. The lumbosacral plexus does, and all of the vessels that are headed for your lower extremity go through the greater sciatic foramen. And this illustration here, I want to make two points. One of them is, here's our uh, obturator nerve artery and vein. By the way, what do they go to? The obturators go to the adductors of the thigh. To be able to, aim, to adduct your thigh, that's what the obturators innervate. So the obturator foramen are right here in the front, right? So that would make sense. And the other one, though, is the um, pudendals. These are the pudendals right here. The pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal artery and vein leave the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. But then turn. Yeah. The, the pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal artery and vein, they leave the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. And then they turn, they're the only ones that do this, they turn and go back through the lesser sciatic foramen. If you just keep that in mind, you'll see it in the lab, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, the other things that are going out the greater sciatic foramen are like the superior and inferior gluteals, um, 
what's going to be the sciatic nerve. All of that big stuff goes out that greater sciatic ground. Only the pudendals do they turn and go back through the lesser sciatic. Now here's the thing about the anal area that um, you see the 90 degrees. There are two sets of sphincters. There's an internal and an external. Internal is autonomic, external is somatic. We know that the superior hemorrhoidal or superior rectal artery, which was the, on the exam, it was the last artery off of the internal mesenteric, uh, inferior mesenteric, right? There's a vein by the same name, superior rectal vein. That superior rectal vein would be right here. That's part of the inferior mesenteric vein. There is an anastomosis around the rectum with that superior mesenteric vein with the middle and inferior rectal veins that you see are draining into the cable system. Remember the port of cable, esophageal varices, hemorrhoids was one of the issues. Well, that's the connection there. The superior rectal vein with the middle and inferior rectal vein. And just so you'll know, the middle rectal veins come off of the internal iliac or drain into the internal iliac. The inferior rectal veins that we'll see uh, Wednesday drain into the internal pudendal vein. But the pudendal vein, internal pudendal vein, and the internal iliac both drain into the inferior vena cable. So portal and cable and astomosis. As a result of that, you can get flaming hemorrhoids. Uh, if they are high up, they're called internal. Uh, I'm not sure where I have those. That picture. If they're lower down, they're called external. I mentioned the other day that the externals were painful. Both will bleed. Because they're so near to the exit, it's the designation you'll often see in a patient's chart. Is that bright red blood per rectum. That means there's drops of blood in the water where it's obviously bleeding. Now, the, the differential diagnosis of that could be bleeding hemorrhoids, which is 90% of the time what the case is. It could be a fissure from hard stools. You've got a little fissure in your, in your anus, little yeah, people get those. You look, you have the expression on your face like, why would you have a fissure in your anus? <laughs> a little fissure right here. It splits open from large or, or hard stools. Um, or uh, cancer. So because it, because it can, it can be bad, if somebody has this, and I'm looking at your anus, and there's no external hemorrhoid that I see bleeding, you're going to a GI doc where they can scope it. I'm not going to, if you put your finger in a, uh, the anus and you feel a mass in there, which is right, you know, it can be right here. Oh yeah, that's an internal hemorrhoid. Oh yeah, big as Dallas. And sure enough, it's not an internal hemorrhoid. It turns out to be anal cancer. You're toast. So, unless you're looking at blood coming out of an external hemorrhoid, you're going to go. What about the volumes of blood? Do they differ between the 
No, and you're never going to bleed to death from a hemorrhoid. Um, so um, it, it looks like, you know, if you put a few drops of bright red blood into toilet water, it looks like you just cut your aorta and the whole thing's red. But it's very few drops. Very few drops will turn urine red, very few drops will turn toilet water red. Uh, but don't, I was an expert witness on a PA that did not uh, call it, they called it internal hemorrhoids. Indeed, they had internal hemorrhoids. You could feel them. But sitting on top of that internal hemorrhoids was rectal cancer. So, refer them. The other thing that can happen with hemorrhoids, I wish I had a picture of it, is they, because they're, it's, a, it's a varicose vein, they can clot. Uh, this is called a thrombosed hemorrhoid. And they're very painful. But when they're external, they're very easy to fix. All you do is you take a scalpel. There's some stuff called ethyl chloride. It's a solution that when you spray it on, it's cold. I think I have some down in the lab. It's cold, and it freezes the skin so that you can stick a needle or a scalpel in it, and it doesn't hurt, right? So you take this thrombosed hemorrhoid, and you put a little ethyl chloride on it, freeze it, and take a number 11 scalpel blade and just open it, or just stab it, and you just shell out the blood clot. It's not that big. It's like this big. Shell out the blood clot about the size of a pecan or pecan, where you're from, and instant relief, instant relief. They'll love you for it. You don't even put a suture in it. Just let them, you know, let them do hot soaps. Thrombosed hemorrhoids. you got to make sure it's thrombosed, though, because if it's not thrombosed, what you're sticking your scalpel into is a varicose vein, and those dudes bleed like crazy. You are, it takes forever to stop the bleeding if you look like an idiot. Okay? Because there's going to be blood everywhere. Make sure it's thrombosed. And it'll be hard as a rock. It'll look like a rock. Rectal arteries uh, is what I mentioned earlier here. Uh, superior from the inferior mesentery, middle from the internal, and inferior from the pudendal arteries. We're going to see the pudendal tomorrow, as I said. Okay. The innervation here, um, the pelvic parasympathetics innervate the rectum. That's defecation. Remember Hirschsprung's disease that you just studied. The external anal sphincter is, or the part of the uh, anus below the pectinate line right here. That is traumatic. <coughs> And so that is uh, pudendal. Mostly everything important that's, that's somatic down here in your pelvis is pudendal. Okay, so let's talk about female pelvis here. Uh, this is the structure here. In case you didn't know, and believe it or not, some of you do not know this, the urethra sits in front of the vagina, which sits in front of the rectum. The angles here are just as they're illustrated here in an upright person. The angles go up and back, and then the bladder and the uh, uterus go more towards uh, forwards. Okay? Uh, the parts of the um, female reproductive organs here. The cervix is a part of the uterus. It's functionally a part of the uterus. It has an external opening called the external os, O-S, and an internal opening called the internal os. You have the uterine body. The top of the uterus is called the fundus. When you look at the cervix, if this is the vagina, <coughs> the cervix actually projects down into the vagina. It's not sitting on top of it. It projects down to it. 
And because it projects into it, it produces these pouches here. So when a woman is uh, on what's called the dorsal lithotomy position in stirrups, she's on her back, has her legs up, and you're doing a pelvic exam, secretions like from trichomonas or bacterial vaginosis or whatever tend to collect here in the posterior fornix. So in your um, description of what you found on the pelvic exam, you would say, you know, uh, no fluid to present the posterior fornix. I mean, it was dry back there, or just normal secretions. Okay. Uh, gonorrhea tends to be a grayish in color. Trichomonas tends to be greenish in color. A chlamydia tends to be watery. Uh, uh, yeast tends to be uh, cottage cheesy. So you would describe these types of fluids in the posterior fornix. And um, many times uh, have I had infections of the of this area that when you put the speculum in and you open the speculum, that's like you're opening a spigot. You know, you're opening a conduit and the stuff just pours out. Uh, so you can, because there's so much room to expand in there, you can hold a lot of fluids inside your uh, fornices. You have the lateral fornix, anterior fornix, and posterior fornix. Okay. <coughs> the easiest way to, to find the cervix is because if this is the vagina, that's the cervix right there. Is to just take the uh, speculum and push it all the way in, and the cervix is going to be on the top blade, and as you open it up a little bit and withdraw it, the cervix will usually come down and you're looking right at it. So that's the easiest, easiest way to find the, the cervix is to push the blades into the posterior fornix, open it up a little bit, pull it back, and the cervix will roll right off the top blade so you, you're looking right at it. Okay? Now, uh, over top of the uterus, this green thing right here is what's called the broad ligament. And follow me here. You've got the per parietal peritoneum right here, right? Down here in the pelvis, it's continuous over top of the pelvic organs. That peritoneal, parietal peritoneal reflection over the uh, pelvic organ is called the broad ligament in the female. It's not called anything in the male. There are a couple of points, though, where it goes up over the organ and back down into the, the separation, like between the uterus and the vagina. And here you see it right here. Not the uterus and the vagina, the uterus and the bladder. So the bladder would be right here. So that pouch right there is called the vesicose uterine pouch. It's not the one that's the most significant, though. The one that's most significant is the one behind the uterus, right here. That's called the recto-uterine pouch of Douglas. So that's the name. Douglas pouch. You'll hear a guy in college just refer to Douglas's pouch. That's it. That pouch, notice that it's going to be between the uterus and the rectum. So if you're on your back during an exam and you've got fluid outside in the peritoneal cavity, uh, like from one of the one of the uh, Presenting complaints of ovarian cancer is fluid, ascites, fluid in the peritoneal cavity. If you're on your back in the dorsal orthotomy position, that fluid is going to collect in the pouch of Douglas. You can actually sample that fluid by taking a needle going straight through the back of the fornix of the vagina into that pouch. And you can withdraw the fluid and analyze it, right? 
They just go right up through here to the needle into that pouch. Now they used to do that a lot, uh, but now it's well, they still do it to a certain degree. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Here's what it looks like from above. And there are a couple of uh, cadavers, I was showing the nurse practitioner Friday, who still have, they look exactly like this. They have their uterus intact. You can see the fallopian tubes. You can see the, um, the ovaries. So they look really good. All right. But understand, this is the broad ligament or the inferior reflection of the parietal peritoneum. Here's the vesico-uterine pouch, and it's the pouch of Douglas right back there. Now this is a um, couple of structures here that we're going to see. Uh, there's the fallopian tube. You can see the fimbria in the, uh, the lab. See the ovary. That ligament that comes off the top of the uterus and goes through the deep ring is the round ligament. off the top of the uterus, goes to the round, uh, deep ring, you can see the round ligament. Now there's another <coughs> ligament that comes off the uterus and goes back to the back wall here. That's called the suspensory ligament. It says uterine tube, that is not the uterine tube. That's the suspensory ligament right there. The suspensory ligament anchors the ovary essentially to the back wall and it contains the ovarian artery and vein. So when I ask you what's in the suspensory ligament, you would say ovarian artery and vein. If you look at the broad ligament, the three places where you'll see it are Actually, I think it's in another slide. Hold up on that. Here's the uterine artery. There's the vaginal artery. Both of them come off of the internal pudendal. Oh, excuse me. Both of them come off of the internal iliac. This is mislabeled as well. That's not the ovarian ligament. That's the suspensory ligament right there. The ovarian ligament attaches the ovary to the uterus. That's the ovarian ligament right there. Let me get you on this side, Cindy. That's the ovarian ligament. That's the suspensory ligament. So is that the ovarian artery still though? Yeah, the ovarian, ovarian artery and vein are in here. The uterine artery and the vaginal artery are not. Remember, the ovarian artery comes off of the aorta up high. These other ones come off of the internal iliac. If we look at the uh, fallopian tube or the oviduct or the uterine tube, however you want to call it, they're different pieces and parts. There's the fimbriae <coughs> attached to the infundibulum. There's a swollen part here called the ampulla and a narrow part called the isthmus. Most fertilization occurs in the ampulla. When you ovulate, the fimbria come up and sort of cover the ovary so that the egg is released into the oviduct. Fertilization occurs two or three days later, and it takes about a week for the egg to the fertilized egg to implant in the uterus. Finally, if you look at the um, cervical odds, the external odds, if you're nulliparous, meaning you've had no children. <coughs> It looks like, like, like a little hole. But through the passage of the fetus, uh, baby, 
If you're multiparous, it takes a uh, more slit-like appearance. Here's the broad ligament in site two. The round ligament is kind of interesting. Remember, this is the ligament that comes out of here, goes down, and for some reason attaches to your labia majora area. A lot of women, as they, uh, as they become more and more pregnant, as the uterus is coming up out of the pelvis, those round ligaments get stretched, and they wind up with pain, lateral pain in here that's not very pleasant. That's called, <laughs> called round ligament pain. Um, and it's constant. Um, <coughs> the pain, it's like, think of, so if the uterus, well, hang on just one second for me. I'll, I'll tell you just a second. Okay. Uh, the broad ligament as it uh, lies over top of this stuff, forms three different areas. And I'm just going to name them. You don't have to pay attention to this, uh, but if you, when you wind up on your OBGYN rotation, it may, if you're in surgery, it may come back on you. The area of the broad ligament that's around the uterus is called the mesometrium. <coughs> the part of the broad ligament that's around the ovary is called the mesovarium. And the part that's around the oviduct is called the mesosalpinx. Salpinx meaning two. <coughs> it's right here. Mesometria, mesovaria, mesosalpinx. Around the tube, around the ovary, around the uterus. Okay? But it's all the same thing. It's all broad ligament. Here's the thing that I made uh, uh, showed you earlier with the ureter being um, water under the bridge. One of the biggest complaints urologists have of gynecologists is that when they go in there to remove the uterus, uh, they clip uh, the ureter thinking that it's some type of vascular structure. And you hear a bitch about this all the time. Um, the careful person is going to watch for peristalsis before clipping, or accurately identify the structure before clipping. You don't want to have to send your patient to a urologist to re-anastomose the ureter that got clipped <coughs> by the gynecologist when they did the hysterectomy. One of the most important ligaments in the female pelvis is this one right here. It connects the cervix laterally to the pelvic wall. It's called the cardinal ligament or the transverse cervical ligament. This is the ligament that supports the uterus essentially. So if you've had a woman who had several children and this ligament is lax, she can prolapse her uterus out her vagina, or at least down the vagina. A prolapsed uterus is something you're going to encounter in your clinical situation. Cardinal ligament is the clinical name for it. When you say cardinal ligament, people know what you're talking about. All right, so the round ligament, uh, you're asking where you're going to get round ligament pain. <coughs> so here's a, this is what you never want to see. You never x-ray a pregnant uterus. Uh, but look how big that um, uterus is at term. That is the 12th rib. I mean, this thing is way up there. Um, you're, you're so there's the uterus, so the round ligaments are going to be going from up there all the way down here. And they're stretched like you wouldn't believe. So that's what produces the pain uh, laterally. You wonder why they have uh, urinary issues and uh, constipation issues. 
Uh, well, there it is, right there. Okay, obstetrically speaking, uh, there are all sorts of different angles, and I don't, you don't need to memorize any of this. Well, what I put this up here for is to show you that during uh, gynecology, I mean, excuse me, during obstetrics, you got to make sure that the woman's pelvis is big enough that will allow the, the infant to go through there. So, during your prenatal exam, you um, you're measuring these types of angles here, and that is essentially from the pu uh, pubic bone to the um, sacral promontory, from the pubic bone to the coccyx. You can feel these structures when you do a pelvic exam, and you want to make sure that they're adequately long enough uh, th that you could uh, have passage of the, the fetus. Okay? There are all sorts of conjugate and angles and stuff like that. Don't memorize any of them. Just want you to be aware that you have to determine this during your prenatal visit. Also, side to side between the two spines is important because that's also a narrow point. Um, but because usually the baby is faced this way instead of that way, it's the, these angles here are more relevant. The male genitalia, um, a whole lot less um, complicated. Um, so we've been through some of this stuff. We know that uh, the spermatic cord here, uh, going up into the superficial, through the deep ring, it goes, wraps around the bladder, and then goes under the ureter. And there it is right there, where it's going to pick up a duct from the seminal vesicle to form the ejaculatory duct. If we look at it in another slide, um, here it is right here. Now this is from the back. There's the urachus, the obliterated umbilical arteries, inferior epigastric. And by the way, uh, Ryan's body over there, it's got these three things. Perfect. I was going to, I wanted to tag one this morning. But I didn't, the, the lateral <coughs> ones, yeah, they're on the site. They're not attached to the abdominal wall. But if you want to see the urachus and the uh, uh, medial folds, go look at uh, his body. Okay? Um, so here's the, uh, the um, uh, ureter is coming down. Let's see where. There's the vas deferens there. The cut thing is the ureter, water under the bridge again. It's going to pick up the seminal vesicles before they both dump into the prostate. Before they both dump into the prostate. If I go back here, the only thing that this uh, slide is showing you is there's a connection between the prostate and the back of the pubic bone called the puboprostatic ligament. If you have a male, when you get inside, you try to push your hand behind the pubic bone, it won't go inferiorly um, because of that puboprostatic ligament. The other thing that this slide tells you is that you see the bladder is above the pubic synthesis. And the reason for that is the pelvis is not parallel to the ground. It's more vertical. If you look at the, uh, the skeleton down there, the, the pelvis is more is angulated severely. So the top of the bladder is really above the pubic bone. Any type of gunshot or trauma above the pubic bone, you run a significant risk of penetrating the bladder, especially if it's full. Especially if it's full. Here's a, another illustration. Here's the vas deferens picking up the seminal uh, vesicle right there. Vas deferens, seminal vesicle, forming the ejaculatory duct as it goes into the prostate. It passes through the prostate and empties into the urethra. <clears throat> now here we go. There's the internal urethral sphincter, the base of the bladder. There is a prostatic urethra, 
or that part of the urethra that passes through the prostate, obviously, if you have prostatic hyperplasia, an overgrown prostate, and as you get older, all men develop prostatic hyperplasia, you can obstruct that prostatic urethra, and you have all sorts of problems related to urination. The problems related to urination would be they come up to the urinal and they stand there for 15 minutes before they actually start peeing. If you ever had any doubt about that, go, watch, go to a football game and you see the old, old guys lined up in front of them waiting for their urine to start. The other thing is that it's a decreased force of stream. Instead of a normal, you know, like pee, it's like dribble, dribble, dribble. <laughs> Not quite like that, but the, the, the force is not there. The thickness is not there, okay? Uh, so hesitancy, decreased force of strain, those are all symptoms of prostatic hyperplasia, which is a given. A man's life is divided into three sections. The, Beth, I swear. The first section is uh, he's getting educated. The second uh, third is he's earning a living, uh, earning his way in the world. The third is he's trying to pee. So those are the three phases of it. I got up a little too early this morning. <laughs> so here's the prostatic urethra. You see that little muscle right there? You remember that thing that I called the urogenital diaphragm early on? That's what that is. The urethra that goes through the urogenital diaphragm is called the membranous urethra. And finally, the, uh, this part down here that's in the penis itself is called the uh, spongy urethra, or the penile urethra. Okay? One of the things about this setup here is that during deceleration type injuries, you can actually rip the prostate off here. So the, the prostate's like a, a walnut. There's the bladder sitting on top of it. There's the urethra coming out. You can actually rip them off of there, like deceleration injuries. Here's the point. Anytime you see urine, I mean, excuse me, anytime you see blood coming out the penis, never try to cap them. Anytime there's blood at the urethral meatus, the opening of the urethra, never try to put a Foley catheter in that. You don't want to wind up shoving a catheter up into the peritoneum. That's not good. What you would do is take a little contrast material and squirt it into the end of the penis and to see if it went to the bladder or if it extravasated into the pelvis. So, and obviously, if you have a, uh, if that's traumatically separated there or a bolst, you need a urologist to sew it back together. Here's the ejaculatory duct on either side. Um, if you get around behind, uh, today when you clear out this thing, if you get around behind there, Feel the bladder, feel on down through there. You can feel the prostate. Prostate's going to be about that big, about the size of a golf ball. And laterally, you can feel the seminal vesicles. Uh, if, if time permits, I may take one of those out so you can see it all together, but I'd rather leave it intact. The arteries, uh, today what you're going to be doing is you're going to be... Um, identifying some of these arteries. Follow the common iliac as it divides into an external and an internal. There's the external, there's the internal. There's a little branch that goes right up, back up into the lumbar region, that's called the iliolumbar. There's another branch that goes down the side of the sacrum, called the lateral sacrum. These branches here are going to be diving into the pelvis and they the superior and inferior gluteals 
I've got to go out the superior um, sciatic foramen uh, and supply the, the gluteal region back here. These small branches here, basically, just look at where they're going. If they're going to the bladder, they're vesicular. If they're going to the rectal, we'll call them rectal. It's not a big deal. What it is a big deal, though, is if you follow this internal iliac on around like that, it ends as the obliterated umbilical artery. That's the one you can follow all the way up onto the abdominal wall and go look at Ryan's body before you start clearing it out to do the dissection. These down here, the internal pudendal, the inferior rectal, superior, excuse me, internal pudendal, inferior gluteal, and superior gluteal, we're going to see when we do the gluteal region. You can't mistake them back there. Okay? But this is what it looks like. Okay? So when you get in there, you're going to find the obturators. You're going to find the ureter or the oviduct. Excuse me, either the, uh, this happens to be the vas deferens right here. You're going to find the ureter coming down, identify parts of the um, pelvic diaphragm, and then tease out the different parts of the nerve, the arterial supply, but don't get too bent out of shape naming them. We're going to identify them precisely when we turn the cadaver over to Mark. The lymphatics uh, is an important point here. The pelvic organs drain to the internal iliac nodes. Remember that the testicle, testicles and the ovaries drain to the deep aorta. Okay? I think that's it. All right. How about our exams looking? Class average on the written was 86.